the things to do which is netflix okay so uh, but thank you so much and uh, i don't think so uh, delhi has a a uh, culture of public lectures as such especially on technical topics but we thought we'll try something different we'll try something new and we are really encouraged by this turnout today uh, i hope more people join in as my remarks wrap up so they don't have to suffer this but have a uh, much more informative and insightful comments from manoj who's come all the way down from bombay uh before i actually introduce manoj and also call on Udbhav, who on part of Mozilla has supported this event. I would just like to tell you what, in terms of events, we are doing and what is our focus and also a little about IFF. So, uh, how many of you have had a chance to actually uh, read or purchase Snowden's book recently? No, none of you? Okay, I can see some hands. It's a really fantastic book and uh, I'll recommend it to all of you. And it's documented from the very first two pages where he describes how the internet has developed over the course of time. Snowden was born in 1983, where we've seen waves of technology develop as he has grown up as well. And he describes it in a way which is filled with emotion and passion. And it was like that for a lot of people who were growing up at the same point of time. This is not to say that technology does not have that same emotional connection with a lot of you and how you're seeing progress. But uh, technology, as it was developing, uh, when we were hitting our dollars, and I'm born a year later, I'm born in 1984, this place of curiosity, wonder, uh, it was not as aggregated, as centralized as we see it today. It was clunky. It was uh, very uh, confusing. And there used to be things which just didn't work the way you expected them to do. And quite often, uh, your internet connection used to be broken uh, by a person who would just pick up the phone in the same house to shut you down. Okay, that would be our parents. And Snowden's written about that itself. But what makes technology really, really fascinating and what has actually inspired a lot of people to devote their time and come forward and formulate an advocacy organization in India, uh, that's the Internet Freedom Foundation, is this uh, quote just on page four of Snowden's book. He says that what makes a life more than what we say, more than what we do. A life is also what we love and what we believe in. For me, what I love and believe in most is connection, human connection and technologies by which it is achieved. These technology includes books, of course, but for my generation, connection has largely meant the internet or communication technologies. And encryption does play a major part in that. And Today, we are reaching a point where technology has in, have, having a very clear impact in terms of how society is structured, uh, uh, in terms of uh, not only what we see on a computer screen, but it's basically uh, as uh, stark as permitting access control to certain buildings or whether people get their rations. And this is brought bringing people together, which includes the trustees and the staff at IFF and the trustees happen to be from the technology sector as well. It includes Aravind Ravi Sulekha, who built Scrollback, which is an open source tool, which was acquired by Mozilla, or it's, it's, it was utilized by Mozilla, and um, he's a technologist based out of Singapore. It includes Karthik Palakrishna, who does product design for Insider. It also includes activists such as Rachita Taneja, who makes the very popular comic sanitary panels. Uh, it includes Ramanjit Singh Chima, a fair bit of you know him from the policy circuit, who serves as Asia Policy Director at Access Now. And it also includes a growing number of staff at IFF. Uh, that's Devdatta, that's Joanne, and that's uh, Shruti and Shivan, people you have just met at the registration desk. Um, all of us are looking at our initiative and doing these kind of events in terms of our larger organizational vision in which we see people as a core part of these conversations, which is why this public lecture has also been organized. And the effort quite clearly here is towards greater public engagement, greater public understanding by facilitating experts such as Manoj to have these with people, not only in Delhi, but in other Indian cities. We we'll keep doing that. And just before I hand it over to um, Udbhav, uh, who, uh, who represents Mozilla and has supported this event. I would also like to uh, uh, compliment how this uh, uh, support has been facilitated in the past. 
specifically through uh, Amba Tat, who supported the Privacy Supreme event, which was to mark the uh, anniversary of the Supreme Court's right to privacy event, where Snowden himself tweeted uh, with the hashtag of the event. And he wrote that we can possess nothing, neither thing nor thought, absent a border between self and state. Each individual right is derived from this line, which we call privacy. Two years ago, India's Supreme Court affirmed the right to privacy and with the hashtag privacy is free. So, as I call on the work, I hope this partnership continues, this support continues and we look forward to doing much more of these events next year. Please do give us feedback. Please do consider to donate to us, to become our members. We are Indian, we represent Indian interests. We are doing our best in, in terms of advancing them in our conception of fundamental rights under the constitution of India. And we derive our legitimacy on the basis of our funding model, which comes from people like you. So, Udbhav, please. Uh, thank you so much, Bhav. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Udbhav and I uh, work as a policy advisor for Mozilla in India. Um, I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to firstly talk a little bit about Mozilla, uh, what Mozilla does uh, as a company and some of the products that Mozilla has, but specifically also uh, what Mozilla has done in the policy space in India over the last uh, couple of years. And then finally, uh, end with a couple of thoughts on encryption and, and how glad we are to support the conversation around encryption in the form of this public lecture. Uh, so with regard to Mozilla, I'm sure it's familiar to many of you, but we're essentially a, a corporation that's owned by a non-profit, not a very common model, but uh, what that means is that we don't have any shareholders, we don't really have to subscribe to the traditional corporate interests as would that you would associate with a corporation, uh, and are primarily known for uh, like Firefox, our browser, but apart from that, we also had other products. We have uh, Pocket, which is the news reader that lets you save articles offline for reading. We have uh, Firefox Monitor that monitors your email uh, accounts for password breaches and notifies you if your password is found in a breach. We also uh, have operate Firefox Send, uh, a service that lets you send across end to end encrypted files uh, over the internet in a manner that is anonymous and secure. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, Mozilla is driven by the Mozilla Manifesto, which, which essentially came about like way back when Mozilla was set up in 1999. That contains a set of principles that have largely remained unchanged for how the company uh, and the foundation go about doing uh, their work and what they believe is fundamental to the internet. Um, and a key aspect of Mozilla is also the community that we have in the country. So Mozilla has over 10,000 members spread out over various communities all over the country that work on open source software, that work on virtual reality, that work on voice assistive technologies, that work on web literacy and many other projects. And, and this community has almost been around for as long as Mozilla has been around when it comes to India as well. So it's a very integral part of um, how Mozilla thinks about India as well as like the internal thinking of the issues that are affecting the country. Uh, in specific, uh, 2014 uh, was the first time that Mozilla got involved in India in a policy debate where uh, Mitchell Baker, our CEO uh, uh, and executive chair, uh, actually wrote to uh, Prime Minister Modi on uh, the net neutrality debate and, and he spoke to members of the tribe, participated in the public consultations and, and uh, very similar to sort of uh, some of the beginnings of IFF as an organization. Uh, uh, Mozilla was also one of the, like, the, the entities that definitely engaged in the conversations around net neutrality as well. Uh, since then, we've worked on uh, data protection and privacy. Uh, as Apar mentioned, we've worked on uh, content regulation and intermediary liability, where some of you may have read a letter that we wrote with GitHub and Wikimedia on the intermediary liability rules. We've worked on telecom and connectivity where uh, we have supported the Grandmark project as a part of the Equal Rating Innovation Challenge uh, that is attempting to connect and connect using uh, some fairly like, interesting technologies and you can find out more about that uh, online. And uh, in general, we also work on uh, cybersecurity uh, as an issue as well. And for us, in, uh, encryption is a very sort of integral aspect of that. Uh, so now zeroing down on encryption, uh, one of the principles in the Mozilla Manifesto is the fact that individual security and privacy are fundamental to the internet and cannot be treated as optional, right? And, and that, that's been a part of the Mozilla Manifesto since 2000. And, and uh, uh, as a part of a lot of the work that, that has happened around the Manifesto, we really do believe that encryption is an integral part of making sure that individuals can retain their autonomy and their security on the online space. We've engaged on this issue globally. We've uh, engaged on the uh, encryption bill that Australia came out with last year, 
we've engaged uh, in the United States in the Apple versus FBI case. Um, encryption was a, a key aspect of the letter with uh, GitHub and Wikimedia that we wrote earlier this year as well. And it's very clearly an issue that we believe um, will play a pivotal role with how Indians access the internet and, uh, and how well they have the autonomy to protect their rights online, specifically uh, from surveillance. So that's broadly about Mozilla and our thinking. Uh, I'd really like to thank Manoj for coming down and agreeing to do this public lecture. It's very, very um, rare and should happen a lot more often that we hear from technical experts such as him on, on, on issues and how we interface with policy. And I'd definitely like to thank uh, the Internet Freedom Foundation, Abar, and, and the entire team for like, being really, really excellent partners with us, both with this event and, like, and, and in the past as well. And we really look forward to sort of working with them in the future. Uh, thank you so much for coming down and we hope Thank you. So um, we got some comments uh, in terms of asking what is a public lecture, how challenging will it be, and uh, will will we actually be able to take away anything from it if you're not a graduate student in computer science? So I leave this challenge to Manoj, who's broken this lecture into three parts. He'll speak on it by himself. And uh, I'd just like you to know that towards the end, we will have a public interaction in which you can send uh, questions through messages to the IFF phone um, uh, and it will be a structured interaction. Uh, also, this is uh, supposed to be a academic dialogue. Even though Manoj has filed an affidavit in the Supreme Court in the Tracy Billiken case, at the same point of time, I would request, let's keep this conversation a bit broader. Let's not be boxed in by the immediate concerns of the day and look towards the future of not only encryption but cryptography much more generally. And this is because Manoj comes with a wealth of experience and uh, a wealth of research. Uh, Dr. Manoj Prabhakaran is the Vijay and Sita Vashi Chair Professor of Computer Science and Engineering at IIT Bombay. Prior to joining IIT Bombay, Professor Prabhakaran was a faculty member in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Illinois for 11 years where he served as an assistant professor from 2005 to 2011 and associate professor from 2011 to 2016. He received his PhD in Computer Science from Princeton University in 2005. Professor Manoj graduated from IIT Bombay in 2000 with a B.Tech in Computer Science and Engineering and had the distinction of receiving his Bachelor's Institute Gold Medal. He has also received the IBM PhD Fellowship, was awarded the NSF Career and Beckman Faculty Fellowship. He has been an Associate Editor for the Journal of Cryptography. His research interests include, uh, span includes theoretical cryptography, widening towards the field of information security and various topics in theoretical computer science. He, along with colleagues from IIT Bombay, have also formulated a set of technical design and policy guidelines for a national identity scheme and identified how Aadhaar's design and implementation deviates from these best practices. All of this is available on his faculty page. This is a mere excerpt from the work he's done. I invite you to go there and explore much more. Uh, given the limitations of how much we can actually assimilate. So let's look forward to this challenging lecture. Uh, and I would like to invite uh, Manoj onto stage also uh, to dim the lights a bit so we can see the presentation a bit more clearly. Thanks, so far, and uh, thanks. <clears throat> thanks to IFF and uh, Mozilla and all the people at IFF for hosting you know, this. Uh, Lecture and thanks for coming over. Yeah, it is a challenging lecture. I've never been to a public lecture, I've been one of lectures. Um, so, this will be a little bit of like a lecture more than a public lecture in the sense that I can't slide. Okay, so I've told the name of the session this encryption to tell us how. The first thing I'd like to start with is. Yeah, it's not really about encryption alone. So it's more to what you was talking about is cryptography than encryption. And that's only one message you can hear in the uh what I need to tell you. So first I'll start with the remote and then back up a little bit that likely uh not do that. But stop me if it's getting too uh you know incomprehensible. Okay, so I'll start with this point and this point you made that cryptography is not full encryption. Uh, there are these two concepts that need to you know, get a secure communication uh, network 
So these are like some of the systemic characters that have this involved. And uh, you know, they are not people who study the concept of uh, data creation. These are not concepts of encryption and optimization. And so encryption is not by itself, um, you know. So encryption is something that can be left to have someone to send in some private message to Bob. It's not a great way of to eavesdrop the job to you know, find out what she's sending. So you've got to encrypt that message so that you can make what it's new from their conversation. Authentication is something somewhat different. Um, when a bot gets this message, and it should look to him that she's not on the web, that the king is not on the So authentication is for the king in school. And if I think, okay, if you're interested in privacy, why do you care about authentication? Authentication seems a little um, you know, contradictory to privacy. You're signing off on somebody that's coming from you and that you're buying to their message. But actually, for secure communication, we need both. Because otherwise, the good school is uh, what kind of it is. It's almost, um, it tells, um, now this is a good thing here, but I'm involved in here, but there's some extra good ideas. And what happens in that message for this evolutionary So, no encryption is broken. Um, you know, this uh, encryption is broken. Um, so, no encryption is broken. This message is sent over the secure channel, but it is sent around. And more. That would be a problem. So you need both um, uh, encryption and authentication for privacy. And we do see a lot of use cases of uh, encryption and authentication, not just in secure communication, but secure communication itself you would see in different ways in your know, daily life. So when you make a website which is HTTPS, it is using secure communication, or you can be your um, the corporate uh, network for VPN, uh, that's also a secure communication channel. Uh, if you're using WhatsApp or an app like Signal, it's end-to-end encrypted and authenticated communication. That's also a use of secure communication. But you may also consider secure communication. You just want to keep your laptop secure, it is as a way of stealing it, you shouldn't see what's in your laptop. So you can use this kind of tool. So, um, their authentication is not that quickly, but um, so that, you know, um, that's, that's a very good introduction. It's not for the new edition. Uh, ID to the blockchain. So, you know, there's a new class with blockchains. The blockchain, I mean, your identity is essentially a, a key that uh, you can use to authenticate yourself. Now, I'll just say a little bit more about uh, what kind of keys there are. Uh, so, that's you know, that's like an authentication um, mechanism, but it's used for a kind of different purpose than for a communication app. Or for like downloading an Android app update, right? or, or in an Android app, um, or in or your, your laptop and the Windows software and it uh, wants to update itself. But how do you know if you're downloading the right software? Right? Are you downloading software from some malicious um, site? Uh, and you don't want to be installing your laptop. So that again can use authentication. Make sure that you're downloading the right stuff. And so these are things that can be uh, you may not uh, realize at the time this is happening, but throughout your computer user experience, encryption and authentication is going to be on So okay, so I said uh, when we're looking for this key, so still so you know, we are somewhat rigorous induction cryptography. So it's not a rigorous induction cryptography, but if you want to say anything about you know, the learn about cryptography, you will make those couple of concepts uh, in the advanced way and then so um, in cryptography your security is derived from the secrecy of the key. You're not relying on the secrecy of you know how you do the encryption, what is the algorithm you are using for encryption of uh, authentication. That's all public. But keep in mind, even standard that's published in the media. Your secrecy is basically realizing the fact that you picked up a bunch of completely random bits, and nobody in the world has any chance of figuring out exactly the same bits. Right? And now, you know, you're going to use this bit for something, and the security of the scheme will make sure that you, know, that, um, you can use these bits and still essentially not be able to. Okay, so that's a key to security, is a key uh, that you can be abandoned. 
Now, I said uh, encryption and authentication, digging down a little bit more, we could break it up like four groups. So, each of the encryption and authentication comes in two pairs. There's a symmetric key cryptography, uh, symmetric key cryptography, and public key cryptography. What's the difference? <coughs> symmetric key cryptography is a simpler concept. So, there is a key that the sender and the receiver have a key of, and they, look, they both hold that key. But I want to encrypt something or when I want to authenticate a message was coming for me. I use the same key that you use to decrypt the message or uh, verify the key. Right? So that seems to be not quite the same key. Public key cryptography is a much fancier idea. I mean, you know, humanity didn't know such a thing was possible until we were able to get back to the kind of evolution. So public key cryptography is somehow like way there, right? Um, you know, within a concept. Uh, the public key cryptography is also a little bit spoiled. What's the idea? Uh, um, it's a goal. Um, so, one part of it is a key, but then, so instead of keeping the whole key secret, you publish something. Okay, so there's a public component of the key and the secret component. Only the key creator of the secret component, everybody is allowed to show the public key. And now, anybody who knows this public component can send encrypted messages to the key creator. And only the key creator can receive the messages in the sense that the key creator can decrypt the messages. On the other hand, for authentication, the key creator is the one here who can send the message. Anybody can use the public part of the key to verify that the message came from the Key creator to create this public part of the key. So that's why the public part of the key, the public key, becomes your identity. Or the art in an online setting, right? You may not know me, you may not know this is like a name for things for me, but you can see that there is some public key here, and whoever created this public key is sending various messages. All these messages come from the same person. So you can think of that as the identity. Publicity becomes the identity of uh, your individual or entity uh, handle or the messages. So that's why we say blockchain setting. I think of one is uh, pseudonyms. Uh, the pseudonyms are essentially these uh, these public keys. They are something called hash for the public keys. So essentially, these public keys. Um, maybe one more. Uh, you yeah. know. Uh, detail which may or may not care about. The public key cryptography, as I said, is very new and magic. Um, the youth is based on very interesting mathematical problems. You might have heard things like factorization is hard, factorization of numbers in time time. Um, and those are the kind of problems that we rely on for public key uh, So these problems have been yesterday by mathematician. Or uh, and they are still, they look so hot. So, you know, we are basing the security of this room on hard and soft. Not really. So, the chicken is probably from the other hand, it's quite simpler. But then, what you could hope to do is do it much more efficiently. Than that. <coughs> so, you could base the chicken to start on also on these kind of hard and problems. But what you would typically do is base it on. For adult problems, they're complex problems, I would say they're engineering problems. They're not natural problems like factorization numbers. It's like a huge um, you know, problem we create, like a huge uh, puzzle we create. And uh, since, you know, so their security is based on uh, when it comes to what you call say, uh, or to generalize these uh, functions uh, and the you know, your complex functions arise on the dramatic attacks on it, then you have some problems So, this is based on our identical description, but they are much faster. And this is what you'd like to use to look at all of your streaming video from Netflix, or like a lot of thing. You know, it's video block Wikipedia, right? They're coming at a high rate. Uh, you, you don't uh, have the time to input everything in the public key. Okay, but 
to Google and to show uh, so you know that text will be set up the speed from the channel of information. We are not going to create a key that will share. How do you do that? That is not new about you until you have signed up on the website. Right? So you don't think they actually create your key and your accounts uh, share in Netflix. But it can happen behind the scenes. So let me do this one last thing with the slide on um, encryption. So the cryptography is nice and it's hard to public encryption of information. But you have to use them directly. You have to put them together all in a very careful uh, way to use them in higher level application. And that's what the security protocol would let you do. So here's the caricature of a security protocol. So you have access to your job or you know, right, or do some transaction uh, on your bank account. So first thing is that they establish a similar channel for communication. And here's how that uh, uh, close. So the balance of entities has public keys. They have public keys that they published and everybody can look at those keys. So there is a question of what you know it's actually the balance key. I'm saying uh, surely it has a uh, it's a certain part. There's a whole bunch of details here. Who certifies them? How do they verify the certificate? And those are important details, but they will just skip over that. So, there is some way to, for Alice to check that this key will be the bias key. And things like Mozilla, Brussels will help you with that. They'll have Alice key. Once she has uh, this uh, encryption, so the whole kind of encryption or KOM, showing you what's going uh, yeah, both for encryption and for authentication. Uh, but what is being used here is actually in the encryption. What Alice will do is she would pick her own encryption and authentication keys, but for some of it, and send something to the bank. But she cannot send them to the bank to clear because then they properly find it. But she can use this channel, uh, the encrypted channel, to this key. So this channel itself didn't use any encryption any obligation from the bank, but then we use the very fine certificate for the bank's submitted obligation. And okay, so now we can Alice is saying uh, uh, so the key is blocked by Alice and the bank know, and nobody else knows. And we can use that to now communicate in an internal obligated fashion. One thing, if you're being careful, you'll notice is that the bank really doesn't know the Japanese spirit. And some articles can be certain there are a pair of keys for encryption and authentication, and the bank would be talking to anyone. But then, once they understand all that, Alice could say, Here's my user ID and pop. So, this has been a higher level of the protocol, and the bank will look up its database, you know, if they leave your ID and password or the volume. Uh, two types of authentication and then say it's not authentic. So that's all you essentially need to know about how HTTPS uh, you know, connection works or how VPN works, but of course, there are many, many more details. Okay. Uh, for instance, what if banks bank has this key, that right? public key and private key, the secret key? What if that secret key got leaked? Happens all the time that we just know. Data is leaked, uh, so the bank's key got leaked. Well, as soon as the bank finds out, they would like to replace their keys. They would like to go around and forget their old keys with our new keys. And how do you do that? So, there is a bunch of details about how to revoke your own certificates and the new certificate. But there are also the details about what about all the old communication that happened, which are using this old key that got stolen. Somebody that has been storing all this communication, so they now go back, use the stolen key, the secret key there, and use it here what happened. Here, right? It turns out again, doing something so that cannot happen. Uh, uh, for common secrecy. And your um, apps like WhatsApp and Signal, they also worry about this. They want to make sure that your phone is compromised today, 
their own messy videos, which have collected by some other Indians. Uh, would still remain on the big paper. Today, steam only goes for the video for the essay. So that's something. Okay, so there are a lot of details, and that means there are a lot of rules. There are a lot of rules for words. So this is like a chapter line of this protocol called SSL TLS. This is a bread and butter protocol for internet uh, secret communication. So you would think not to be very good in the protocol. protocol. Unfortunately, it was telling all the uh, right things to scan attacks on bugs or uh, breaks of this uh, secure protocol. Supposedly, it's a secure protocol. Break, so then uh, they would make it broken, they would fix. Um, and that, that was the fact of that. Hopefully, things will change. Uh, you know, uh, so, here, one point is the most recent version of this whole protocol. And, you know, the hope is that that will fare better than the usual one. Alright, so that brings me to uh, so that that is all I wanted to tell you about how the how encryption of application works you know, for secure communication. Um, but um, you know, as I was saying, you know, not all that secure is by having encryption of application. And the reason to see and this is again my caricature of uh, uh, how to understand the secure order work is having the big models. So there is the problem that I talked about, not that there is a problem, there are many problems, um, used to very uh interesting application. Then there are protocols that put them together, and then at the top there is a whole zoo of applications and hardware devices and humans like you and uh, we sitting and you know, using these protocols. And we do a very bad job of using these protocols, or browsers do a bad job. Using these protocols, um, our operating systems do very bad. And our hardware devices do very bad. Or even some of them do a good job, they get, you know, others, you know, maybe the Mozilla, the browser is doing very well, and running on an Android operating system, which has been um, problematic, and then there's nothing that the Mozilla application can do with the operating system service components. So this is a to the smooth of um, you know entities uh, they don't nicely play into the data, they don't necessarily play on the, the protocol. Now in terms of security, um, uh, so cryptography, I would say the safest on these things. There have been attacks on these stream protocols, so it, it, uh, it has happened, but some much can by some flaw in the uh, process of what gets standardized for uh, the reference of the government's back installing backdoors in this capital. The mainstream has been broken all the time, um, but it can be broken. Um, protocols, as, as I was showing you, do get broken more often, but actually it's not. If you look at the actual protocol, the intention of the protocol, the design of the protocol, they are often sunk. What is problematic is the implementation. So, underlying the design, somebody writes down this mathematics at home, you've got to have a paper saying it's all secure. Uh, then, somebody takes that and writes the code software that implements that. And there's a lot of gap between the design and the implementation. Okay? And uh, same with protocols. Protocols are more complicated things. Um, so, you can read this out of scene, you can the design documents for the protocols. And then they get implemented, and there are all these bugs we are talking about simply come from the uh, implementation, mostly come from the implementation. But on that is nothing compared to the vulnerabilities lurking in the uh, application space. So, um, so it's, um, yeah. And when you have a compromise, and so the application. You know, uh, it's compromised means the user is compromised. Right? So, you know, it doesn't matter if all these things are secure, but somebody has made a copy of all your keys, then they can become the user and use different things that they want to do. Right? Um, or somebody has managed to log in with 
presentation about uh, you know, uh, similarity. Uh, so there are, in particular, there are issues like um, <coughs> subject matter that I talked about. Um, the second question is that the bank is clear, the bank is clear, the bank is clear. They get compromised because their application is not very really bad, or they are in some way bad application. They are compromised. Somebody could access their keys and use it to uh, certify the ministry that's being added. And everything is being stuck. And you will log in some, or you will be yeah, thinking of something else and get back. Um, yeah, so the endpoint vulnerabilities are the biggest problem. Um, so if you get to know them, uh, which is the, uh, you know, the grades are not really a different problem to them. The rest, there are very few international that have happened, but mainly the vulnerabilities are at the level of active application, the higher active application. Just in case you're not talking about any time. Uh, that's fair enough. The CD is a possibility of common vulnerability and uh, explosions. And it's a list of from CD 2019, blah, blah, blah. Uh, there's a vulnerability to open this for uh, similar uh, the protocol. And this one is that as you go to the page and start exploring. And it's a long list. You keep scrolling and keep scrolling. And you go right on. And you're still in 2019. Okay. So this all the work will be at the report we can really see uh, in the last one year for sure. And they're all over the place. They're on the internet, they're in Android, they're in iOS, they're in many applications, you know, Cisco Optimus. Um, and they just think maybe you know, one that don't use or care about. Um, but there are tons of Okay, so that's kind of uh, the really, uh, you know, conclusion of that part of my uh, lecture. Any question, anything I can take questions that. I am used to the classroom lecture style that I've asked. As soon as something is not clear, please ask. It's not the last page that I just uh, was using. What's the name? We are using Sigma. <laughs> yeah, so we are ready for the present uh, event. Okay, so uh, I'm not a you know, I'm a tutorial expert. I don't have a lot of uh, expertise on I'm talking about sociological issues, but here is my take on it. So there are kind of two different communities, two different kind of disciplines or two sets of disciplines. And one looking at things like you want to play the just and happy society, you know, you know or humanities uh, kind of question. And then there are this uh, engineering or science kind of question. Do you want to build the most efficient, reliable technology? Uh, and usually it's clear which you know, what falls where, right? You're asking about a question like fairness or human rights, you know, that's a question about the just society. Or you're asking about AI you know, or artificial intelligence. Information security, the photography policy. That's the question of squarely uh, designing the engineering side of things. But things are not that uh, simple. You know, this growing realization that all this has been there, this is growing in more now, that there are other things that happen in the community. Yeah, so, for instance, there's a fear that many people, I guess, of a year old or couple of years old, have been with them. And that comes about because people have started using AI uh, you know, algorithms to decide on questions like who gets what, uh, who gets put in prison for how long, who gets whatever. Our question is about you know, are you being fair to this person? And I mean, you know, the data shows that you know, this class of people are, um, you know, they tend to be, tend to uh, get back to the world of the so they shouldn't have gone to the soon. But then that's because biases are not against and these biases are being reinforced by the data. Biases of the data show that people are being, and they are reinforced by the algorithms. And uh, it's a vicious cycle. Right? So, um, you know, how do you deal with it? Another way to think about it is fairness. You kind of thought of fairness with lots of people's issues. The CFMA is unfair, you know, that kind of intuitive. 
And then I knew that doesn't work. I was thinking you're giving me one more expression. You're the fucking one for the time. You're the dumb nigga. You do this thing if you're the higher one people from this one and that class where I'm at. You can go to the other way down. Well, you know, should I define that one fair enough? Or should I say that's how the qualifications are probably going to be? It's not very fair. Um, so it's a very difficult question to define to formally say what is fair or not. But it's not a, an absolute thing, right? It comes from our sense of what is right in this um, one. Yeah, it's not, it's a difficult question. But people have started now asking this question because we have uh, some elite algorithms to make decisions that privacy is a little bit like that. Like, it's not clear what should be private or what would be considered. I'm standing in a room immediately. That violates my privacy. But maybe I'm okay with that. For now. Um, but maybe in another setting, it may not be okay. Right? Um, so, what is privacy? It's a very hard question. What is privacy? It's a very hard question. There are some scenarios in which we have very good senses. We have a very common privacy. The census data. You want to calculate statistics from the census data? What kind of statistics can I give you without compromising anybody's price? That kind of person would have some very nice definitions, but there are also some other privacy questions that are ambiguous. So that, that's an open question to define what privacy is so that we can use the technology to get the right level of privacy. Um, so that brings me to privacy. And uh, you think that bodies are much more qualified. Uh, um, Some people are going to be much more qualified to talk about it than I am. But you have no idea. Irrespective of what privacy is, actual definition is, it seems like we call it agree that it is a fundamental right. The Supreme Court has that it's a fundamental right. And the reason is without adequate privacy guarantee, what that means, there are a lot of things that you know, social entrepreneurs think bad things that happen, right? So, we really need privacy, uh, but we don't quite know what privacy is. Uh, but, but we can tell that we need privacy, we need security. If you're at some level, right? If you're what are you right to, what are the email you send is going to be hacked in the world. You thought you can read it, then you probably have lost a lot on the privacy. If you have one more second privacy, you can say that, um, uh, if you don't have security, then you're going to lose some privacy. But there are a privacy in modern security, a privacy needs modern security. A lot of privacy brings you that. Don't need any security needs. Okay, so uh, Google tells you no rules, right? There is no security that is broken. It's all with informed consent, but you can ask, uh, uh, is, that, is that what you want or should there be a uh, better control over your price? <laughs> so I'm not going to really go into that. It's a bigger question. Like what is the right level of privacy? What is the right level of coercion you can use to get the permission from the question? Um, I'm going to stick to this question, right? You do need some security to get some privacy. Uh, so it is not security is an enabler for enhancing privacy. So that's one aspect of security. It gives you privacy, it's a good thing. But there's a flip side. Which is that security or technology also enables a lot of things that you would think of as bad things. So, ransomware you know, is something that can, it's malware that can affect your laptop, then it puts on your desk and says, pay me so many, I'll send so much bitcoins to this address, otherwise, they never get your data back. If you send so much bitcoins, magically, you know, they will send you back something. So that's a, that's a business model. So that's ransomware. It uses encryption, 
users uh, something like Bitcoin, which has a lot of options, a lot of cryptography uh, uh, techniques, right? Cryptography. Ransomware is a special case of extortion there, or uh, uh, similar, uh, you can say it's a yeah, similar thing. It's also asking you to pay your partners, but it may not be about you know, if I hear encrypted, uh, uh, encrypting your disk, they'll just say, you know, we have been filming your, uh, filming you through your laptop or camera, pay up or else we will release it, right? And then people do get money without necessarily knowing whether uh, they're checking it or being able to check and see if it's true or not, people might just pay. Sometimes it could actually be true too, yeah. uh, nothing preventing. Um, Video cameras uh, being at Google happens uh, yeah, but this would also it's going to be just a, an easy way for uh, a hacker to make money. Right? They're not going to do anything. They're not going to do anything. They just send it to mail, spam mail, and you know, sit back and get some money. Uh, this all malware. There's another side and the kind of crime. So there's the notion of a dark net, which is not internet that's readily accessible unless you know you know how to look for it, what to look for it, you won't get there. So it's not something you spend upon. Um, and not everything in the dark net is illegal, but there are illegal activities. So dark net is a place where you can stay anonymous, right? You know, those websites are not publicly visible. You don't know which servers are hosting them, so they host some illegal content. You don't know if you're just going to down the server or people are going to the server because you don't know where it is. So there is both are illegal activities and there are illegal activities. There have been big cases like the Silk Road, or the big company that was flying in the dark net and you know, shut down the user, you know, like actually easily catching the mail for people who are running it. So that's one kind of uh, issue. Another is, um, you know, what we thought was a good thing. People can securely communicate with each other. But for many people, uh, and for some people, other people are not people who should be communicating uh, or communicating with each other. So if you have law enforcement and you see criminals are communicating with each other to plan some crime, you can try it, right? And maybe they have, so I could just see what they're talking to you, maybe they can catch them. So, unfortunately, all of this is using the same kind of book cryptography we would be using, and it's, it can be very effective. It can be frustratingly effective if you are a law enforcement or a okay. So, that is the start. So, governments are very, you know, have a large, you know, most hate relationship with cryptography, unless it's cryptography they are using within their so a lot of this has to do with historical cryptography is something uh, with a military background, right? With a, you know, it came from World War, sorry, and then German uh, uh, army, or maybe it's communicating with their uh, submarine or anything encrypted uh, uh, messages. And the British are trying to deal with it. So there's a, there's a whole history of cryptography being used for in war, right, by governments against each other. So that's kind of you know, a background for historians that you can make. But since the internet has come about, cryptography is used by everyone. Uh, but uh, you know, a lot of things in cryptography happen. Starting in the military world. So, in the 70s, public came book that I've been talking about as this magical scientific revolution that happened, magical revolution, was invented at GCHQ, the government of aviation headquarters in the UK, which is like the, uh, so in the US, there is the United Security Agency, uh, and GCHQ is the U UK workshop, and they were made with made a pattern of the rule. Um, so, mathematicians that DC screen meant in public cryptography, of course, they didn't publish it. Right? Only they knew about it. Um, I don't think they used it for much, but they just went on with it until it was rediscovered in open literature in the US um, a few years back, uh, later. 
In sanctifying the symmetry peak of the world, you what? Everyone knew about it, and they said, okay, time to standardize this thing. The nation, you know, the US needs this standard so that you can uh, uh, incorporate and so forth. So they're trying to do digital encryption standard. Uh, the standardization bodies are working with IBM, one of the people who are actually providing the design. And NSA decided it shouldn't be too strong. It shouldn't be so strong that NSA cannot break into it. Because then, you know, before I had the previous fiber, NSA is coming from point to law enforcement. What they see is good to play with that part of the world. Right, so they decided to intervene and try and restrict the piece of the test. And it did happen, it was restricted, and it was considered weak you know, from the time it was born. Uh, now it's completely broken, it's a very standard, but uh, it, it was there for a long time. Okay, uh, I think it's got some synthetics on uh, NSA. So for cryptographers, if you go to some of the conferences here, yeah, now we have different. Pictures for the adversary. One of the pictures you see is the adversary is the NSA logo. For developers, NSA is quite the most powerful adversary, better than any of the, uh, stronger than any of the uh, hackers and uh, you know, even other nation states. So NSA is a good example for adversary to keep in mind, the model of adversary to keep in mind, they're kind of in this basis. However, to be fair, this will also help with making this strong. Uh, they knew about certain attacks um, that uh, would actually break your design that you uh, came up with, and they fixed the desk so that the desk design so that those possible attacks will work. Nobody knew of this possible kind of uh, attacks, so nobody knew why it hasn't changed me. So they wanted a strong system, they said they wanted the pieces to be small so that they could brute force that necessary. But it was going to be a national standard or a global standard. They didn't want it to be fully breakable. Uh, so the way the government worked was cloud in relation to this. They're back to have a good crypto for serving for themselves to talk to their military uh, or within their military or uh, the government itself. They would also be happy to have security for their citizens, maybe not so much that you're going to break them, but they certainly don't want the you know, other militaries and other governments to have good success. So when all these people are new in the 70s, uh, you know, there were export regulations saying if you build a software that has encryption, don't make it too strong. And, uh, and then they shouldn't be able to export it to a foreign country. And then, of course, somewhere in, uh, forget, maybe Norway and uh, or Finland, uh, very strong encryption software was created, PGP. And uh, you know, then everybody could use that and didn't have to rely on US export laws for uh, getting good uh, security. Um, uh, in the 90s, there was another famous incident of the government fighting the crypto community. Uh, and there was this thing called the Clipper chip. The government proposed that, or NSA proposed that, get this chip, um, which, can, which has you know, circuitry in there to encrypt voice and uh, data messages from mobile phones, from mobile phones that was coming out. And the catch is that you can lose strong encryption. But the keys used for the encryption will be kept with the government, be escrowed with the government. So the government is not saying we'll just you know, use it, but if there is a need, we can go and put it out and figure out the key cause of communication and then whether it's for. For many reasons, it didn't take off. The government pushed for it, the community pushed against it, and uh, the industry then uh, really pushed for it. So it didn't really work out uh, for NSA. Okay, and you know, we kind of know all along that the government in the US and elsewhere, but you know, my story is mostly uh, based on what I say. Uh, mostly what people talk about are the things happening in the US because 
for one, that's where a lot of the initial things came about, and that's also one that's happening in places like this uh, with, the, with the walls. And then a lot of things are back, so as far as sitting on Snowden, there was not any detail about the classified document. Uh, so we call it the Snowden Revelations now. And in short, in particular, for the presence of a couple of programs, uh, many, many things actually. That I just mentioned to Google and Legia. They are, there's an American program, there's a British program to basically attack cryptography. Uh, how? You can't really attack the labs. You can not, that's right now, right? But you can, uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, you can uh, discover and exploit vulnerabilities in the protocol and the information, right? Uh, so they actively do it, which is good, right? If somebody is weak, you need to find out. Uh, so they, they, they do that, but then of course they want to use it without telling anyone. The whole point of finding vulnerability is to actually break one things. Right? So this is a very successful program. Uh, no wonder you don't know what problems these implementations have. So, NSA and GCH who are sitting probably on a pressure for one of uh, But sometimes it kind of bites them back. Um, so if you can find a right of and it's not fixed, maybe somebody else can find it too. It could get even worse, even if somebody else couldn't find it, they would actually steal it from you. Okay, so there was this one instance where a weather bridge was uh, leaked. Uh, and uh, Monica, I like, think, of ransomware, which used some very solid uh, vulnerability discovery that uh, NSA had done. Um, another thing that these um, programs try to do is backdoor the standard, meaning install and like, weaken the standard, weaken the actual scheme that people are using um, out there. And so that they hopefully, to them, only they know about the weakness. Okay. And they somehow convince everyone that there's a strong system, strong encryption scheme, let's use it. And usually when that happens, there's a big one instance where we know that happened, or we think it happened. Um, and that case, the main instance is why this looks like a weak scheme, why you don't want to standardize this. Um, but the only data that we speak, the weakness was actually discovered. And uh, then it turns out that it was actually. Uh, something that NSA has been pushing for, uh, even working with the companies that are access to it. Another uh, instance where the government wants to break cryptography and the news was uh, this case where the FBI, uh, uh, you also mentioned, uh, also has been working on the tool that I made. Um, uh, again, but everything here began to read this kind of more on, on the internet on Wikipedia. Uh, and maybe it's not a book. Uh, so, this was another example that they were able to break open some uh, encryption in iOS. Uh, so, you could, you know, uh, that Apple should build systems where there are always going to be to break open. It's not true, usually, if you just build a system, you generally feel okay. You know, uh, hardware on which you're running is now Apple company will be able to break it just because they are putting it on the product in an Apple phone. Uh, but if we are wanting Apple to actually build some backdoor in the iOS so we use the picture there, the standard iOS provided in the trip, it should let FBI uh, open it, or it should let Apple open it, and FBI code it. Um, then uh, they Go forward at that time, but it's kind of a similar issue that a lot of what the community believes that the big problem that people have is for this kind of the interpretive, so this can be interpreted, and it seems like the world is going dark for them, they get to fight crap. Thank you. So, how do you think of this then? Like, what's the right thing to do here? Should we, um, you know, uh, go with what the government said for the safety of the public. public. We shouldn't worry too much about privacy. Just have it being open. 
uh, all country go with the privacy is a fundamental right, but in crime is not uh, you know, what we should try at all. So that will be a false binary. So let me try to get some sense of uh, kind of some way of thinking about it, just my personal take on it. And I want to start with a disclaimer saying the analogies are uh, not the best thing, so I thought of what I wanted to say here. Analogies like a shadow is uh, actually. And I'm just like a shadow that gives you uh, an outline from some perspective, from one point of view, but it hides a lot of things. Uh, I hope most of you are ready with that. I thought it's too, just to my first acting and this other one, you can quote me on that. Uh, and I'm just like a shadow. It's good for dramatic effect, but I may not be the best way to do this. It's just like that shadow. Okay, so with that, I hope that you know. Anyway, here's what the government way of usually uh, talking about the product is or the corruptions of the product is. It's like a weapon, so we don't let people use weapons freely, you regulate it. Not everybody is allowed to use weapons, even if you can call a gun, you can call them a short rifle, so some limit on the strength of the weapon, how many people it should be allowed to use. Well, people made a different analogy. It's more like an army. You don't kill people, or you don't directly kill people with your encryption, or attack people with your encryption. With your encryption, you are protecting yourself. You're protecting your data. Of course, it should have a secondary effect of well armored, you can go in and shoot people with more impunity or something. But the Dutch analogy should be that it's more like an army. Well, yeah, you know, the says it's still there, it should be there, right? You can use this R1 and you go and shoot people um, with impunity. Why do you want other people to use this R1? So here's my you know, contribution to the century of Delhi. I thought, here's the right idea. You don't think of this weapon in the army or anything. It's like an anti pollution mask. You're stepping out in this toxic air. If you don't wear this mask, you're close. You cannot survive there for much long. Uh, you may not realize it now, but you could have the uh, effects down the line. Everyone should have the right to use an anti-pollution mask. And do things like that. Now, of course, that mean your uh, hole is snatching your back and running. You could also be using an anti-pollution mask and they can run further and faster if they have to But are you going to yeah, so yeah, the way should be the most for somebody to say, well, good, good. has always been different. That shouldn't you know, be the only reason to uh, deny common benefits of loss. Okay, so that's kind of my analogy for the day. Uh, in an analysis, though, I do want to make a couple of uh, uh, very more objective points about it. So, another very good reason why there's a bad analogy beyond whether you like this or that. So, technology <coughs> that you want to regulate is usually must be like nuclear weapons or assault rifles, but it's hard for somebody to just build it in their backyard. That you need the material, you need uh, infrastructure to create this thing. Encryption is not that bad. It's really cheap and simple thing. You read a textbook. You buy a computer with some old, you know, uh, big games of water. You can board up a very good encryption system, as strong as it gets, right? You read the right text and you can do it. So it's not, it's not going to be something you can prevent people from using. Anybody can build it. So, um, now, you might say it's illegal. If I see you using it, I'll come and catch you. That should be a good event. Well, if you try to do that, you'll just Make it, I don't know, and pick the, the, the next level there. You can actually do things, encrypt messages or put messages, put encrypted messages into clear text in a way that somebody who looks at it finds that clear text. Okay, so you can embed your messages so it's called stereography, not as popular as encryption, but because you need to show people why you need to do it, it's encrypted, there is a good reason. But if you need to show, uh, 
Apiano, um jeito. Não, 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 You can't really put it back in. Science is discovered, mathematics is discovered, that it is possible. And now that we all know what is possible, I think we can do it. At least, certainly, we can have the resources who are the criminals, who are uh, your enemy state. They can do it, no matter how much we try to prevent that or, or by legislation. On the flip, on the other side of that, if you do let people use, Stronger currency everywhere, you get a lot of benefits from it. You need it for most of commerce, right? E commerce. You send your credit card information over the internet. Why? Because we have confidence that nobody is going to be able to use it and find out its credit card information. We believe that it's strong enough. If there were restrictions, they are not strong enough. You know, some, I don't know, some foreign state around the country. So, US or China or Russia or whoever has the capabilities, can read all your private data as say Indian citizen here, as soon as you get there or with your companies. So, you are an Indian company you know, and people are buying things from them on the internet. Well, maybe some uh, foreign country would just be able to steal all the information in the same person if you use a leak encryption. And that part, they can be commerce, right? Business uh, uh, work. So there is a good uh, reason, even if you didn't care about human rights, if you just wanted to have uh, uh, good business uh, and I'm a lawyer, it would still be. Of course, you'd also want good journalism, good uh, uh, debate for public safety. All these things benefit from having. Good as no the criminals, but that you cannot do much about. So, kind of the takeaway from this slide uh, uh, is following: If you try to regulate your currency, ban it, or weaken it, or by building back doors, you end up getting a worse report. Don't want the best report, but you end up the worst report. On the one hand, the criminals will still be able to use most of that, and then there's some. Uh, less sophisticated criminals not be able to, but the more determined and successful ones will get a little uh, as strong as it is true. And the poor businesses and the legal and the law abiding citizens do not be able to. So you neither get the benefits of strong currency nor protect yourself from the good side of. So this will be another very big thing to do, to try and regulate the work. I want to give one more perspective. This is a little technical. It may not make sense if you... Uh, yeah, let's see if I can make sense. Make this uh, uh, So you could ask, okay, so this idea of banning was probably not good. Why not just have bad words? Let the government Break in. That's kind of what we have a bonus for this. Well, there is sort of one obvious elephant in the room, which is if you don't have bad doors, the police put this back up. So, the knowledge about these bad doors is with the government. And you trust them. Okay, so some people may be okay with that, some people may not be. So, that's the point. But that's not what I think. There's another bigger issue, or another more conceptual issue. What does it mean for a scheme to be figured out? Well, you might say, uh, even from the informal layer, we it's really so far. It's okay, a scheme is secure, nobody has to get out of the That sounds good enough. Right? Nobody has found out the danger of breaking the action. You can't say, oh, I found out the way to break it by brute force, but it'll take them a lifetime to do the words. That's not a bad thing. If you found out the way to break the action, you mean, uh, and here or something that like, yeah, that is probably like that. So to be secure means not being secure. But actually, the character that is not the definition of security. 
the technical definition of a uh, like doctrine scheme, say, being secure, that there doesn't exist an algorithm for breaking. And this might be kind of you know, surprising because if you think of anything I can build, you will somebody probably should be able to do it. And that used to be the idea of uh, cryptography in the like, so, the 19th century. But that's not true. There are, we know there are mathematical problems, computational problems, which simply need so many steps to complete. So, it doesn't exist the part that I have to know that for a fact. And hopefully, I can build an encryption scheme where um, doing the encryption is something fast and everything I can do. But breaking it without the key would end up being one of these problems, which simply doesn't have a cost algorithm. Okay. That was the thing that I think she's here. I don't know if you say why I made this distinction. I put in the area because I'm working with these kind of questions, you know, should be honest about it. This definition we don't know how to achieve yet. The mathematics, or the state of the art of mathematics today. Doesn't let us prove these things. But that, I think, is a problem with our mathematics uh, technology so far. In a few decades, that might change. We hope it will change. Um, there are uh, 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 related problems, feature and the, for instance, the play mathematics, open problems, less, um, each one to solve the other million dollars. And you know, there are problems related to this. There. Uh, so, we will need to, when I claim, oh, my scheme is secure in the definition, that will be based on some poor mathematical assumptions. I try to bring these mathematical assumptions as uh, making as uh, small and difficult as possible, but yeah, till I figure this out, I don't know. Okay, so that's a caveat, but for the purpose of this talk, we can ignore a little bit of problem for mathematicians. From the technology perspective, this is what it does. Right? These are problems that we believe in the truth that they don't have an efficient attack. Yes. Now, if the government says, let's not use a scheme like that, let's use a backdoor scheme. So what is a backdoor scheme? It's an uh, analogy of entering a fault. So there's a front door with a key there. And you know, so the government doesn't have a key. Then the back door still has a door, it's an open thing. That wouldn't satisfy our definition of being secure, right? because there exists an algorithm to get into the They might not found it yet. But if there is a back door, there is a way to get in there. What, when you use such an algorithm, what you're doing is that you are using something which is insecure. It does have a back door, it's a matter of time to put something on it. Yeah, let me maybe you know, take a long time for some point this, but this is a big risk to take. This is not how security should be done. If you want to be in this world and you build a fall, you shouldn't have that okay? Instead of hoping that there is a background of money, I know about it so far, hoping nobody else will find out, it's just you know, rather than speaking. Points about you know, trying to regulate is bad, but the backdoor is bad. You just have to deal with some technology, right? The genes are important, and the contribution of that state. You just have to, again, again, here also, you can put in all these backdoors, there will be the standard. This will affect only law variations that are using the standard. Your you know, hardware criminals wouldn't be using this backdoor, they will be using properly secure. Okay, so let me find the uh, so just gazing into the crystal ball, like what future holds. I don't want to tell you something interesting here. But let me start with the obvious, yeah, we have a problem, we have to fix them. Which I'm not, I'm not talking about the policy side of things right now. It's not taking a problem, but there's no other gaping holes here, how to fix it. A lot of people are working on it. There are much of a surge on you know, making the design and implementation uh, need uh, uh, make the implementation needs in certain specs. Uh, so software verification uh, technology for making sure there are not bugs to catch bugs. 
out here, it's sort of much more uh, complicated work. Uh, first, I would think you need a complete overhaul of the current ecosystem of like, how operating systems work. They're all built to competition, they're all built to speed. They know in the works. And my mind, they're not worried about the applications attacking each other. We just wanted to get the most efficiency out of the table for parallel processes, whatever. So this, these simple systems are designed for the more uh, benign needs. Something needs to be complete, and new needs to be done. There. Uh, I don't know what, <coughs> probably <coughs> nobody else knows what at this point. And there's not as much work here because it's tied up with so many moving parts. Uh, you know, Humans are in the room, operating system, hardware devices, um, and the industry is not interested in overhauling anything. So that's that's obvious future directions to go in. But then again, it's something maybe you have not heard of. And this is closer to the kind of work lot of people like me and others do. We work in here for the Let me set up with this story. So suppose Alice is an government agency. She has a lot of pilots for people in this list. Uh, should be allowed to purchase airplanes. And Bob is an airline. And some customer has come to purchase the ticket from Bob. Bob is supposed to confirm that this customer name doesn't appear in the pilots before selling the ticket. Okay, so the natural this three blocks is should I send that list to Bob? Bob is just a random airline and so it's a government agency. Maybe a bad idea, like you know, sensitive information should uh, Bob be allowed to know that. Okay, maybe Bob should just send the customer's name to us. And Alice can check if it is in the list and tell Bob if it's in the list. Well, that affects the you know, privacy of all these customers, not just the customers not in the list. That's in for anyone who works. And the last part we debate about what is the better work we can do right? But here's the this. If you know enough crypto, you don't need to do either. You can magically have Alice and Bob talk to each other about a first part. And at the end of it, Alice learned nothing other than the fact that Bob engaged in certain protocols. So Bob had a question. And Bob learns nothing other than yes or no answer. That whether you know this name is in the list or not. He doesn't know anything about the list or anything that this name is not there. It's just kind of impossible to think of it that's possible. But actually, you know, it's almost the same kind of impossible thing uh, that Dr. Kiko does. It may not have been part of the impossible thing, it doesn't sound it's impossible, and that kind of sense is also impossible. And when you see it for the first time, it is not possible. But trust me, it is possible. And this is the whole area of secure multiple authentication, which is a lot of It's an area that's it's not like something that came out yesterday. It's been there since the 80s. You want to show me after what you're doing. But it's only in the last decade or so that people are actually. Maybe just the product is something that is inaccurately able to do a good secret. Uh, but it's only in the last few years that uh, it's come out. And <clears throat> just to really highlight this, there's a proposed bill coming in the US right now. We use this kind of technology for building some databases where uh, with some of uh, higher universities or students should be able to play about you know, the meaning of their work. So but some particular application, but in the uh, in a reach of uh, the knowledge, you know, there's been enough visibility to be with it. I don't know if it's possible or not. And there's more where this comes from. It's not just, you know, we do very interesting things with respect to auction. Like, you know, auction is such a tricky thing, right? Is um, you know, is somebody does somebody know what uh, your competitor is bidding, or you just bidding, and you know, we can actually use the multi-body position tools. 
the more uh, from my electronic voting. There's a certain idea about a secure voting scheme, and we are just you know, really that. There are other ways to do it. There are other possibilities. So, so that's all I wanted to say here. I'm just going to refresh your memory. We talked about you know, taking it from the whole thing. Uh, we talked about this little layers of uh, your application and uh, where vulnerabilities are. The flip side of uh, privacy is it's all good to uh, it's all good to get privacy, but they also uh, help crime. But the response would be, I guess, just look at it and you know, fight crime in good order, good order, way outside. You know, hope that some of criminal will be reduced to that is not an option. And the last thing I mentioned was, yeah, so first of all, there's a good fix this stuff, the gaps. And the, the most, I would say, the exciting thing for researchers is that we have, we're sitting on this tool which has got an information for the privacy of the commerce. Right now, so competing. Um, industries are uh, competing uh, populations should uh, work with each other without revealing their no private secrets. So that's not part of our problem. Okay, this is amazing, like a best movie that I'm holding this one. <laughs> and, uh, but this is a public interaction. So uh, the kind of questions they've got, we have to interpret them a bit to again make them a bit careful. And I know uh, people are not used to that. That said, every question we have got from a person, we will reflect it. Also, Manoj has at 11 p.m. flight, so we'll be wrapping up in 10 minutes flat at 8.30 p.m. Uh, this is to account for wrapping. So, just starting out, Manoj, uh, I'd just like to ask you, with the advance in the uh, computational part, for instance, in quantum computing, uh, do you see challenges to cryptography just in terms of the force? Theoretically, yes, uh, but uh, practically not anytime soon. So, the nuance uh, about uh, quantum computing is that the technology, the hardware technology that's there, so we are listening about quantum supremacy, okay, by Google, they, they, have, they can do something which conventional computing couldn't do. But those are probably small problems. Those are kind of, those kind of problems are not breaking smaller scale. On the other hand, in principle, you know, once you build sufficiently large computers, you will be able to break certain encryption uh, schemes very efficiently. Now, if you, I'm sure you didn't notice, but if you have to look at the first slide where I put in uh, mathematics, uh, you know, so, there are two examples. The first one was, uh, Something that I want to be put in principle, right? The reception of that thing. The second one is a candidate for a problem for which quantum computers doesn't because they don't break out of that. So quantum computers don't solve every problem. So what I mentioned about you know, some problems that you know, we have continues to hold even for quantum computers. It's just that the certain problem which is pretty hard to get good with answer. But cryptography has to be based on the problem of the domain hardware, which is really good. Now, I'm just telling you as a proof that when I say the domain hard is hard, that way, like, maybe for that kind of problems to be solved. Can, can I take this a bit further? Because I'm, I'm really illiterate when it comes. Okay. So, uh, uh, recently I read about how, even in AI, the conventional model, which was in terms of forming logic parts by just feeding in raw amounts of data and then doing error correction is not changing into much more neural uh, and creative uh, deployments of AI uh, designed by itself, uh, which was visited in terms of a very practical example in China where uh, the Go game uh, uh, was actually the competitors defeated in that and their claims of creativity in AI. So, can AI also be one added layer of vulnerability for cryptography? So, AI is not really a threat to cryptography. What AI solves are 
easy for the first one is in the center of the center of the center of the center so they are using the center they are not computationally complex problems so um, it's a it's a more uh, so those of you who know about the knowledge of the center 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 AI is just conventional computer at the end of the day. It can only solve things which does not exist in the algorithm. AI is just in the lab. The technology algorithm AI is not solved. So AI is not per se a bad. Now, AI can have a there are problems for which there are algorithms. AI can have to disclose the problem. Uh, AI can have to put analysis. So, secure the engineering problems that I mentioned are not based on. Not that you're going to be the VR, but that it's some you know, complex engineering problems. Um, you know, people are like that, they're using their faith in the AI, and AI can help those attacks. That's right. Yeah, that's not a major concern. And uh, I think you uh, have some author, but there's a book you were mentioning also. But only for graduate students. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, no, he's modest, so you're saying don't mention it because uh, it'll seem hybrid for you, but not for that. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, multi-party education is an important thing here for production. And I'm just to talk, just to give them a bit of taste about it as well. I think we discussed. Earlier in August, how it can be used in voting systems? Can you talk a little about it? Um, or like, there have been pilots around it, right? Okay, so yeah. Modern network is many things. If you want to find applications in the world, I say, I'm going to do this. One of those things uh, would be a recording for the thing that you mentioned earlier. Right? So, can I think of the recording for the time? Um, how do you verify that your vote is getting found? But two parts there, right? He talks to both these three types as he talks, and as he being counted as How do you verify that it's being counted as a Currently, it's just you're hoping that the machine will be your vote. Right? Um, but there are very good views for sure. You can have a publicly verified uh, mechanics of the video. So when you go, and this is the way that all the votes in some sort of like form, not very good. And later, you know, that vote can be tallied using a secure multiple information protocol. So, so now the the vote is just a tally of those, you know, unencoded votes. And you can see, you know, but nobody link particular unencoded votes to the count, you know, party A was X vote, party B was Y votes. You don't know which vote went to party A, which vote went to party Y. That is true, or the counters will be able to prove that the census will be H1 and H1. They'll be able to prove that all the votes were counted. These many votes translate to export for the property that they can't have. It's kind of another unthinkable thing that how do you prove something without really revealing any information? So I mentioned this about the keyword and the number of zero knowledge. So another question is the question of the census that they want to have. I can convince you of things without telling you why they're true. I can convince you that it's true. And so if I just came and told you it's true, you won't trust me. Then you run this protocol, then you can say, okay, I believe you now, but I have no idea any better than when you start with why it is true. That's a zero knowledge proof. That's very useful. You can use it to prove, and I trust that you the tagging, you know, because if you send up your votes, I'll be prepared to come back and forth and talk to you. You don't trust me, I'll run this proof. Then you have no idea if you have a different before this. You don't have to be more than So, so there are those kind of very different kind of, uh, very useful to the whole time of the that the product may have cost it. And I always be very efficient in the way of speaker relationship. I think all this should start with being aware of these things. And these pilots have been tried? Ah, so the electronic voting, yes, there are concrete, there are concrete actions in Australia. Or also in many of the, yeah, there are many instances where I create a new species. And this is a final question I'm just asking. 
This is all the record, guys. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, seriously, um, the sorry, what was the question before that? The, you were talking about uh, uh, applied uh, cryptography, how it's applying, and how uh, what's a good place to start on the main part. Yeah, so because of blockchains, right? Uh, and they use uh, certain amount of tools. Who do you something like you know, there was so much money in this one and then there was a lot of this block and then we count that and we try to work with other ones without telling you what the amount there is in um, who, yeah, so without actually decrypting anything and so have proof that whatever you can make for that you do pay money out of nothing there. Whatever that game is working on, it gives a large proof. So now it's a bit. You know, practical consideration because there's a lot of money in the blockchain. I think we're acting here and just for these three months, we're going to get a good blockchain. Maybe one is less than a short box of it. So maybe why not? Well, uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, well, thank you, everyone. This is conversation I've been a little about how I read this chapter in uh, the EFF special volume. Uh, uh, by next week, is in, which is titled as Edward Snowden Talks to His Lawyer, and the lawyer is not paying for good reason because he's an idiot. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I feel like that one today. Uh, this has been a masterclass almost. Thank you so much for your time, and um, thank you for your public engagement. We will keep encouraging people from uh, the core sciences to engage much more with uh, important social questions, and I hope this. Uh, this with, which you told me in your first public lecture, this is one of the first of many more. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the Saturday. I'm uh, really, really thankful to all of you who spent this time um, and uh, uh, not finished on the next session. I would also like to thank you for coming here and speaking to us. Please have a great Saturday. I hope we'll see you again soon. Thank you. 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 Uh, but yeah, hopefully, this is not the last lecture of the current period, but otherwise, you know, the science that we'll come across. Hopefully, it makes sense. Even.
Please join us in the video. Thank you so much.